works in the show, um, but uh, in honor of Women's History Month, we're going to talk about the great women leaders in Africa. In Stories Without an End, you see the vast variations in how women are portrayed. Privileging one attribute over another is more about examining a characteristic that is useful in the moment or for a, a, a function more than about making sweeping statements about the role of women in different African societies. Likewise, the women that I have chosen to discuss this evening exemplify certain attributes that I see unify women in the depths of ancient history with the women in leadership today. Strength and power, loyalty, but not blind loyalty, leadership, and community. If we look at the work in the exhibition, we see symbols of strength, compassion, spirituality, and nourishment, visually expressed in so many different ways. Consider the Galladay mask, which you see kind of front and center here, uh, the feature, exhibit, uh, feature image of this exhibition. The Yoruba Galladay tradition from southwest Nigeria began in the 18th century and functions uh, to honor the spiritual powers of women, in particular elderly women, lovingly called our mothers who based on their experience and wisdom are elevated to a more powerful status within the community. This authority is similar to the influence of ancestors and can be used to the benefit or the destruction of a society. Thus, the Galladay Festival expresses gratitude and reverence. It is said that the eyes that have seen Galladay have seen the ultimate spectacle. Another variation of masks that expresses female leadership is the Zoe mask, which you see uh, in the top right corner. Uh, and 
course, Elizabeth Peterson will be discussing this further in her upcoming lecture in just two weeks' time on the Sunday Society. Soe is emblematic of uh, the literal power that women hold uh, to run the government, to educate, and to maintain social order. Alternatively, the Luba throne and staff, and the staffs that you might see in the exhibition, suggest another form of power. While men hold the leadership positions among the Luba, the women hold the secrets of royal authority and the history of the royal line. This begins to expand our understanding of leadership, and that is where I'd like to begin this talk this evening, with an aim of investigating and thinking about how leadership comes in different forms. How um, you can prepare or advise a king. You could be crowned the queen herself, or you can plant trees for peace, or spray paint no to military rule on the streets of Cairo. Obviously, there are so many women that we are not discussing this evening, from the pharaohs of the 12th and 18th dynasties, or the 15th century queen mother Idia from the kingdom of Benin, to the Dahomey Mino, the fond female warriors, or from the Kenyan uh, artist and filmmaker Wanori Kahua, uh, who founded Afro Bubblegum whose mission to produce art is driven by a belief in a fun, fierce, and frivolous representation of Africa. Or Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, a Nigerian writer and MacArthur Fellow, who has thoughtfully turned our attention to the incredible breadth of literature coming from a continent and famously examined the dangers of a single story. We could also talk about Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first elected female head of state in Africa and winner of the Gandhi Prize of Peace, Disarmament, and Development, and the 2017 Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership, which is not awarded every year because not they can't find a leader every year that exemplifies the properties that they uh, want to bestow upon. She's also the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize, uh, in which she shared uh, with Lehman Gabawi, also of Liberia, and Tabakol Karman of Yemen. Um, and they were given the Nobel Peace Prize for their contribution to the nonviolent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace building work. Um, but alas, we shouldn't get carried away. The first three women that I want to discuss today are historical and express their leadership in more traditional ways. Uh, even the formality of their power as the strength behind male leadership is a traditional way of thinking about female attributes and women's roles. The final two figures I'd like to talk about are contemporary women who have expressed their leadership and activism in more creative ways and methods that facilitate change and strength in unexpected media. I thought we could begin with Queen T. Uh, from the Amarna period in the New Kingdom, Egypt. We could talk about many women in the court during the reign of Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, most famously Queen T's daughter-in-law, Nefertiti. But I find what fascinates me about T is her role as a key figure in Amarna's foreign relations. Both Amenhotep III and Akhenaten married foreign women, creating strategic political ties that solidified their power. The relationship between T and Pharaoh Amenhotep III is an interesting one because she was not born of royal blood. Her father, Yuya, was associated with the throne through military and priestly titles. He was the god's father and the commander of the cherry tree. Her mother, Tuya, was princess of Min. Her parents' names are um, known from a series of large commemorative scarabs issued by Amenhotep III. Um, one of which you can see here. And you can see Queen T's um, name in the cartouche here. And then uh, it says her father, Yuya, and her mother, uh, Tuya. Uh, they were also, her parents were born, uh, uh, excuse me, buried in the Valley of the Kings, uh, which is very rare. There are only a few private tombs there. The mention, the mere mention of the queen's parents is unparalleled in Egyptian history. From Nubia, T was known as the commoner's queen. Though she rose to prominence and became a powerful force during her husband's reign, 
and a key advisor to her son on film. Queen T is represented in numerous sculptures and relief, indicating that she was a significant player in the religious building and cult programs in Agnathan. Images of goddesses were created with her likeness, and T was worshipped as a form of Hathor at her temple at, uh, in Sudan. But also the emphasis on the queen's role as the king's divine companion was the model not only for Akhenaten, but also for su subsequent pharaohs. And she was so shown sometimes as a sphinx, which was, is a model that um, had previously been reserved for kings and gods. But perhaps most importantly, she uh, is mentioned in the Amarna letters. Uh, in, in particular, I've pulled out Amarna letter 26. The Amarna letters are a series of tablets that doc document diplomatic correspondence from the New Kingdom. To Shraddha, king of Mitanni, which is a kingdom in the Arabian Peninsula, writes to T herself to appeal to her son, the pharaoh Akhenaten. <clears throat> and the letter states to T, lady of Egypt, Thus speaks to Shraddha, king of Mitanni. Everything is well with me. May everything be well with you. May everything go well for your house, your son. May everything be perfectly well for your soldiers and for everything belonging to you. You are the one who knows that I've always felt friendship for your husband and that your husband, on his part, always felt friendship for me. And the things that I wrote and told your husband and the things that your husband, on his part, wrote and told me incessantly were known to you, but it is you who knows better than anyone the things we have told each other. No one knows them better. You should continue sending joyful embassies one after another. Do not suppress them. I shall not forget the friendship with your husband, but at this moment, more than ever, I have ten times more friendship for your son. Uh, and this, I think, is, is one of the keys. You are the one who knows the words your, of your husband. But you have not sent me the gift of homage which your husband had ordered to be sent to me. I have asked your husband for massive gold statues, but your son has sent gold-plated statues of wood. As the gold is like dust in the country of your son, why have they been the reason for such pain that your son should not have given them to me? Neither has he given me what his father had been accustomed to give. So I think that this is key because upon the death of Amenhotep and the rise of her son Akhenaten, T managed foreign relations, and so was the one with the control and power to influence her son's behavior, but to also perhaps smooth over any indiscretions. The unprecedented thing about T is that no previous queen had ever figured so prominently in her husband's lifetime. Here we see T, uh, the colossal statue of Amenhotep III in T, and T is made the same size as Amenhotep. Um, so, regularly appearing besides Amenhotep uh, in statuary, tombs, temple reliefs, and her name is paired um, with many objects uh, that accompany um, her husband's uh, vessels and jewelry. Um, but she's also uh, associated with um, the cow's horns and sun discs that are often attributed to the goddess of Hathor. T's role uh, maintains stability in a turbulent time of change, but likewise, if we could move forward several century or two millennia, two millennia, um, we can look at Sogolon Kande, the mother of the first Mansa or king of Mali, Sundiata Keita or Sunjata. Uh, Sogolon Kande preserved the key elements needed to restore uh, order to the rightful king of Mali, one of the biggest and most significant kingdoms in the history of the continent. The epic tale of Sunjata uh, tells the story of the Mansa story, and Sunjata, which means the lion of Sogolon, begins with the strength of his mother. The story begins with Dokamisa, the buffalo woman, and one of the greatest sorceresses in Mande epic traditions, who is Sogolon's sister. She gives advice and the key ingredient to two hunters, the two hunters needed to kill a buffalo that was tormenting a town. The town, in exchange, will give them the choice of any woman or women they choose in gratitude. But she explains that they must choose Sogolon, who is deformed. 
But dopamisa is the one responsible for deforming uh, Solon. In one passage she says, how could I make her so ugly when I loved her so much? I put my far-seeing mask on her face, her uh, sorcerer's mask on her face, before she was old enough to wear it. And in doing so, cut her tear duct, caused her hair to fall out, and put a hump on her back. By putting her on my sorcery horse when she was too young, I twisted her feet, stretched her tendons, and made her knock me. All of this is my fault. I take the blame. And if she does not get married, it will be my curse. So when the men of Do Ni Piri bring those beautiful Kande women to you, do not accept them. Choose my father's last born. Some call her humpback Sogolon. Some call her ugly Sogolon. Everybody used to call her whatever they felt like. But the real name of that last born child is Sogolon Mulan Kande. There will be something special on her breast for you because she will have all of the Dailulu, or the items that are, uh, are imbued with magic and power. Sogolon's physical deformities signal her possession of special occult powers that she will pass on to her child. Sogolon was given to the king, Magnan Kanapara, as his 52nd wife. And in spite of the wrath of the, his other wives, he loved her, and more importantly, he trusted her. She gave birth to Sunjata, but he was unable to walk. So Sunjata and his mother were banished to a small hut beyond the palace. He was cured, however, by a blacksmith, a profession that's highly regarded in Africa for their skill and ability to make shape metal. Sundiata uh, becomes a skilled hunter, a brave warrior, and a natural leader, regaining the confidence of his father. They are exiled after Kunfara's death, when Sunjata's half-brother defies the wishes of the king and rises to power. Indeed, these same elements that I discussed earlier that caused her deformities, the sorcery mask, the sorcery horse, and the sorcery bow that the hunter used to kill the buffalo, she carries faithfully for her husband to pass on to her son. When it is time to give her husband's legacy to her sons, she asserts her authority. The three men sit, but Ma Sogolon Kande stood up. Uh, and this is another passage from, uh, from Sunjata. Women would usually be seated during a hunter's ceremony, but here they did not sit down. While they were st standing, Ma Sogolon Mule Kande said, The people of Ma Mandan have come for you. They are calling you to war. When your father died, your half-brother wanted your father's gold and silver. He also wanted your father's legacy, but he did not know where to find it. That's why he has plotted against you all this time. He thought that when he killed you, he could take your father's legacy. But my sons, you do not have your father's legacy. Don Karan Tuman, the half-brother, does not have it either. I have your father's legacy here. If you are seeing that a man's legacy went to his last, last wife, it is because my husband trusted me. When my husband was dying, he gave me his Dalilu his legacy to me so that I could keep it safe and give it to you when you reached maturity. I have brought you here now to give you your father's legacy because the Mande people have come to take you to war. But what worries me is that there are three things in your father's legacy and they cannot be separated. Those three things were the sorcery horse, the sorcery bow, and the sorcery mask. Sunjata affirms his mother's loyalty. Out of all his wives, why did my father give this legacy to you? Because of your devotion. It was for us you were so de devoted. I trust in God. Even if you do not give me the legacy, I will vanquish our enemies because of your devotion. Bring out the legacy. While Sunjata and his brother Mandanbori insisted that their father's legacy should not be split up, but given to Sunjata, the middle brother insisted that he have his share. Grateful for Bori's selflessness, she takes Bori behind the bush. And Sogolon says, Mande Bori, you've honored me, and so now God will honor you. You prefer to keep uh, you prefer to keep this secret so I would not be shamed. Come and let me give you my legacy. My legacy is something that did not come from here. I will give this ring to you. So long as you live, it will protect you from genies or enemies that might threaten you. It will also keep you safe in the bush. If you find yourself in trouble, look at this ring and say, Ah, oh, mother. If you do that, God will protect you. So, so long said, this is your keepsake. Of course, 
Sunjata and his brother return victorious. They capture the throne, and the Mali Empire is born. What I think is critical is that in each moment of transition throughout the text, it is Sogolon who instigates the change. It is the magical items that deformed her that are used to save her own town and are the very items that she uh, can keep safe. Sunjata cannot walk despite all efforts, and it is only when his mother is shamed that he finds the strength. And when the Mande uh, come to find Sunjata to bring him home, it is Sogolon whose sudden need for a traditional flavoring, gato, which is made from dried hibiscus leaves and blossoms, that takes her family to the market where they meet the men who have come to look for Sunjata. And finally, it is her power that allowed her to carry those things she needed to protect her sons and restore order. Queen Nzinga of Ndongo and Matamba was not quite so humble about her efforts to garner power in the late 16th century. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of information about Nzinga, and the majority of my research centered around the 1769 publication of Jean-Louis Castillon's colorful biography, Zinga, Reign d'Angola, in Paris. And Zinga is known for her diplomatic skills, particularly at a moment when there is an incredible amount of tension with the Portuguese and an economic battle over different channel functions of the slave trade. When Anna Nzinga became queen in 1624, after the death of her brother, she was able to negotiate with re regional African rulers, the Portuguese, but also the Dutch, who would eventually seize Portuguese control of Luanda. By converting to Catholicism, she aligned herself with Portugal, which meant that she had an ally to help her defend against other African invaders, uh, but also the Portuguese stopped raiding her kingdom to supply the slave trade. The story of negotiating the peace accord with Portugal began with the Portuguese governor in Luanda patronizingly placing a floor mat for Nzinga to sit, rather than a chair, during the negotiations. Among the Mbundu, a floor mat was reserved only for subordinates. Instead of being submissive to his insult, Nzinga ordered one of her servants to get down on the ground and sat on the servant's back during the negotiations. It wasn't long, however, before Portugal betrayed Nzinga, exiling the queen and her people, where they established a new state, Matamba, here, Nzinga offered sanctuary to runaway slaves and Portuguese-trained African soldiers and developed a new type of militia. Ultimately, Nzinga's contribution focused on developing Matamba as a trading power by capitalizing on its position as a gateway to the Central African interior. By the time of her death in 1663, Matamba was a formidable commercial state that dealt with a Portuguese colony on equal footing. Switching gears and several centuries to Wangari Matai, who I think is an inspiration and transformative in the way in which she thinks about how peace is won. Born in Kenya in 1940, Matai was the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn a doctorate degree. She got her start as an activist and member of the chairman, uh, member and chairman of the National Council for the Women of Kenya, founded in 1976. It was under this organization that she introduced the idea of planting trees in order to conserve the environment and improve the quality of women's lives. Formally established as the Green Belt Movement, she assisted women in planting more than 30 million trees on their farms and on schools and church compounds. She then expanded the Green Belt Movement in 1986, establishing the Pan-African Green Belt Network. Matai explained the connection between the environment and peace movements in her lecture, Rise Up and Walk, for the third Nelson Mandela lecture in 2015. Excuse me, it was in 2005. Um, she said, what is clear is that there is a close linkage between the sustainable management of resources and equitable distribution of the same on, on the one hand, and democratic governance and peace on the other. These are the pillars of any stable and secure state. Such a state has the enabling environment for development. People who are denied the values of Africa eventually become angry and frustrated and undermine peace and security in the neighborhoods and beyond. For that reason, we need to manage our resources sustainably, accountably, and responsibly. We need to share those resources equitably. Otherwise, we shall continue to invest in wars and conflicts, 
fighting crime and domestic instability rather than promoting development and thereby eliminating poverty. She did serve in, pa in Parliament, so had kind of a uh, more formal platform with which to make change. But it was really her work on the Greenbelt Movement that garnered her the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> One thing that I think is important um, as we're speaking of contemporary women is that you hear their voice. So I'd like to share a clip um, uh, of Matai speaking. Uh, and this is from an earlier interview after she won the Nobel Peace Prize. But um, it was um, pulled out again after her death in 2000. That's okay, I'll summarize. So what she essentially is that it, it is this fight over resources that um, creates this uh, that creates this uh, inequitable um, space where corruption can move in, where poverty can take over. And I think what's really important about that is that she made a connection immediately between resources, uh, the natural resources in Africa, uh, you know, from complex things like minerals, um, but. Uh, and, and gold and diamonds and things like that, but also um, these sort of simple basic elements, trees, clean water, um, and, uh, and the way in which trees can transform a, an arid space into one that can support farm, farming and things like that. And so all of a sudden make the, made a very clear connection between um, those natural resources and the, the distribution, the unequal distribution, of wealth resulting in corruption and war um, uh, in, in parts of Africa. So in Kenya, working on the, at the grassroots level to make sure that she was um, teaching women how to plant trees, uh, which all of a sudden created forests that she could, that then brought the water closer so they weren't walking so far. It was a very practical element um, and, and problem that she was solving, but the way in which it sort of Trickled, uh, trickled up, uh, and really changed the actual political makeup of a certain country. So, as simple as planting trees, um, uh, uh, Matai was able to transform the way in which uh, Kenya operated. <clears throat> so, we began in ancient Egypt, and I'd like to sort of end it in modern Egypt. Um, if I can take you all the way back to 2010, when a Tunisian produce vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, self-emulated, self, uh, setting off a chain reaction of revolutions across the Maghreb. This protest led to revolts in Libya, Yemen, and of course, um, probably most famously, Syria, which resulted in a civil war that has lasted eight years, uh, nearly to the day, actually. The uh, Arab Spring had begun. In Egypt, protesters took to the streets in Cairo to unseat Hosni Mubarak, who had ruled Egypt for 30 years. One such activist was Egyptian artist and designer Baia Shahab, who perhaps first found her way into the international stage just a few months before when she created her work A Thousand Times No for an exhibition, The Future of Tradition commemorating the centennial of the exhibition Masterpieces of Mohammedan Art at the House Dirkums in Munich. Shahab found the word no written in 1,000 different calligraphic scripts and, and created a curtain displaying each of the no's. 
Um, so this is the curtain, but I hopefully, if it's loud enough, I'd like to show you a brief lecture that she gave about how calligraphy, which is her new term combining calligraphy and graffiti, is a critical form of activism generated by the 21st century revolt. So we're going to give it a go. If not, everybody has homework. <laughs> I know, we heard it earlier. No. It's just coming through the computer. Yeah. You want to put on closed caption? Can you do that? The CC over there? Yeah. Can you
trauma, oppression, and the unsettled state through her work, and by lecturing in cities all over the world, and now she typically paints poetry in, um, in her calligraphy. Uh, she's done it on the walls in Vancouver, Marrakesh, Tokyo, Beirut, Amsterdam, Istanbul, and New York. In a CNN interview from 2017 after she had won the UNESCO Sharjah Prize, along with another calligraphy artist, um, one from Tunisia, LC, Shahab described the first moment she spray painted on the streets of Cairo during the revolution. She said, quote, it was one of the best moments of my life. It is still vivid now in my head. It felt so liberating. I felt like I was actually screaming. I really admire these strong women who would stand in rallies and raise their call and be the first ones to call. I was so jealous because I could never do that. And then I had the spray can and I said, yes, this is my place, this is my medium. It was extremely liberating as a form of expression. For somebody who doesn't have a very loud voice, my voice was my spray can." So the story of women in Africa is really the story of beginnings, of change, and of strength and compassion. Uh, and it was just brought to my attention today, and I realized that perhaps it was um, intentional, but that March is Women's History Month, um, and that March 8th is International Women's Day. So it seems like a really sort of wonderful moment to think about um, uh, about these leaders and how we're sort of imbued with all of these characteristics, all of these elements, uh, especially as we think about how it speaks to the exhibition um, that's here, uh, but but also you know the stories that we're continuing to tell. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or. Um, have a further discussion. This is nice and intimate, so. Yeah. If we go way back to the beginning, the second woman you spoke about, you spoke about what she wrote, could you 
talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So this, this piece where you mean that um, Sir Jazza's mother? So, so go on. I think it was this one here. I think she was the second one. This one? No, no. Oh. I did you. Um, so she is a Nigerian artist. Um, <laughs> uh, excuse me, Nigerian author. Um, she now, she lives in America, I think she did her MFA at Yale, um, she, uh, wrote about the dangers of a single story. She grew up in an educated class in, um, Enugu, which is in southeast Nigeria. It was, um, it's a college town, essentially, and, um, and was... Uh, you know, after she was born, was recovering from the Biafran War. Um, and she talks about how, you know, she grew up in a home with books and, and literature, um, but they were always stories of, you know, little white kids in England. Um, and that creating this character that never uh, represented her or looked like her shaped the way in which she saw herself. Um, and so her... Her goal in, in producing literature is, is really to, um, to represent many different stories, but she's also very passionate about um, promoting African writers and African literature. And there are several programs, such as like Africa Day Story, um, which is uh, essentially a writer's workshop, and they produce a volume every year um, uh, of short stories of young, emerging, um, African writers. Um, she, her most famous book, um, and at this point is not, is maybe a decade old, is Half of the Yellow Sun, which, um, describes the trauma, um, uh, as the Biafran War was beginning, um, and, you know, certainly weaves in issues of identity and things like that. She writes for the New Yorker and, um, is, uh, now I think sort of a mainstream writer, whereas you know, probably before we thought of Chinua Achebe and uh, Wale Soinka and, um, and, and I think now it's sort of emerged as this um, figure that's really representing the, this new generation of African literature. Um, I've been teaching Sanyata in our core curriculum here as a supplementary text. And I was fascinated by your focus on Sogolon. Uh, how did you come to take that approach since typically when one describes that story and history, it's focused on the emperor? Sure, rightly so, in a lot of ways, right? Of course. Um, I, I think that it's true, I mean, you don't, she's not, you know, her name's not on the first page or anything like that, but I, I absolutely noticed her, and, and perhaps I've always noticed her as the figure that comes in at a moment of transition. And so it's not um, so much that she is the most prominent character, but whenever we see something shift or something change or risk being taken, um, she's the one and she's the reason that um, that the outcome happens the way it does. Uh, so I I think that, and I guess I can't particularly say why I saw that, but I, I, and maybe it was because I was looking, I've always been looking for a sort of strong female role, the strong female role in um, African work. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, she is there sort of instigating these changes, these transitions. I also, uh, another female character who I think is, one can make a case is quite important, but is mentioned not so much, is mm -hmm. Nana Triba. Mm -hmm. uh, because if she had not been able to tell uh, Sogolong uh, how to, uh, uh, or Sugiata, uh, how to uh, win the battle, and these uh, weak points. Yeah. Right, and, exactly. And it's easy to sort of uh, forget her, 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 yeah. her, not give her. 
which is kind of the case in history, right? The yeah. women tend to be sort of written out, um, you know, that they seem as though they're minor roles. I think it's if you compare it to uh, like Luba royalty and the work that we see there, um, on the surface, you might miss the fact that they're sort of the most important figures there, that everything the king does is determined by what they know and how they represent it. Um, so I think, I, no, I think it's a great, great point and, and absolutely right on. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any particular reason why you don't what was the question? Is there any reason why it didn't include has oh. headshots? Because people know about her. I was trying to, you know, pick, pick people that maybe, you know, were not quite so prominent um, that you have to kind of look a little bit more. Um, I mean, Queen Zia um, is sort of mischaracterized quite often. Um, so, yeah, I was trying to look for the other people. But if you look at the Marna period, I mean, you there are um, 12, like, pretty important women that play prominent roles um, in uh, Amenhotep's and um, Akhenaten's court. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's a, a great catalog um, uh, that the Met put out. Um, that really sort of outlined their roles. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to go for a super obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just very curious. Um, given the magnitude and the vastness of African art, how do you organize dramas? I and how do you how do you bring together such you know, just they're getting the, not only a timeline that goes back to Mali, uh, that's 14th century. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how in the world do you really convey what you would like in your class to know about that? Um, well, a few things. I mean, one um, is there are certain ideas that I certainly want them to think about. Um, and I typically focus it around those prominent themes like masquerade. Um, and oh. with the goal of sort of opening up the way in which we think about masks as something um, that uh, gives shape and form to spirits and ancestors. That it's very different from the way in which we think about masking in the West, where it's something that conceals your identity. Um, so all of a sudden, by just shifting that, even though we might, you know, I'm not giving them the specifics, we're not covering masking, you know, West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, we're sort of getting those tools that you need in order to and look at all kinds of, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's, I, I've always found it incredibly challenging, and I typically start with, this is not a comprehensive look at African art, you know, um, that after studying it for 15 years, I don't know anything about it. So, you know, I mean, it's, and I'm, I'm fairly comfortable saying that, but I understand, I can see how at a certain point you feel like you want to know it. Um, but I think that's what's kind of interesting. So I, I, I tend to organize it thematically um, rather than something not chronologically. I was waiting for you. If you talk about in terms of traditional societies, Luba and Shokwe, for instance, other maternal societies, and yet women were subjugated except for the initial founder of the Shokwe Empire. Do students have any qualms in terms of accepting that here we are talking about matriarchal society and yet it's the son who receives more of the honor or limelight rather than the mother? Right. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, it is much more challenging with our 
frame of mind today to talk about, uh, you know, I mean, just even traditional societies and then, what, I mean, even America, you know, the American traditional societies, I think, are really challenging um, to um, develop this sort of connection. Um, and I actually had a conversation this year with, uh, when I taught uh, historical African art last semester, uh, we were talking about um, Gallaudet, you know, and they're so excited because here's this masking tradition that's all about women and honoring women, and it's, you know, the, the day of women and all of that. And I, I was like, well, yeah, but men dance it, and it's and it, it's it's based on the framework uh, of that men created, right? It's not necessarily driven by women. Um, but I also think it's just about shifting the way in which you talk about it, too. You know, it, um, if if ultimately it's about making sure that the best people are in charge, the wisest people are in charge, the people with the most experience are in charge, then Gallaudet is a really important um, society and an important sort of life safe stage. Mm -hmm. um, but but it is. You know, hard. I mean, especially when you do bring in more political and complex issues like female circumcision and, and what that means um, to to girls um, in some of those things. Um, so it's I'm I'm not sure if I'm like specifically answering your question, but I I think we have to also accept like that you know when we're talking about historical um, you know societal structures, we have to respect that. Too. Um, so yeah, it's it, but it's it's certainly hard to teach students and to teach a new generation um, how to think about African art in a progressive way um, when it appears that it's sort of you know, traditional. Could you look at the liberty of the society? The image is conjured up. The woman is heading. And here you see Luba's tool with women is mm -hmm. the Right. Bearing the burden on on this and it is meant for her son to see her. Mm -hmm. And carved by so a male yeah, artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean and it's perhaps it's you know, it, again it's just shifting the the way in which you talk about it. I mean, is it mean that the son, the king, is sitting on his mother, or is it that the mother is the, the column that supports? Right. I mean, so yeah. No, I I think it is complex in that way. That it's uh, it's you know it, you really have to understand the way in which the Luba you know think about. Yeah, natural, you know. Could you talk a little bit about this exhibition here? It's kind of a continuation of already what you've been saying, but where you have the grandmother project so closely affiliated with this traditional art. And do you think that that works in terms of raising these issues and uh, stimulating the discussion? I'll make sure that Elizabeth gets to chime in mm -hmm. on that too, um, because she brought the grandmother project. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, you know, especially the way in which we frame historical African art, it's typically this thing that happened in the past, this thing that was created in the past, um, and not allowing for this continuing tradition of uh, of so many of these practices, the masking practice. I mean, Gela Day still happens today, Sunday still happens today. Uh, the Luba are still, you know, producing royal arts, um, even though the way in which they have, you know, the, the formal political structure with which they rule is very different. Um, so it's, I think it's, in some ways, what's so lovely about having the photographs from the Grandmother Project here is to really not look at, Af you, we can no longer just look at Africa in this, through this historical lens but really see that it's a continuing tradition um, and, and that, you know, part of its survival is about its adaptability um, and its ability to change 
uh, over time. And that's really important. And I think that we don't often allow African art to have that voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we speak in this, like in the academic setting, we call it the ethnographic present, right? That mm -hmm. Africa was the same um, until the colonial encounter, you know, even like for millennia, millennia, millennia. And we know that that's not true because that's just not the way in which culture moves and is developed. Um, but where there's something, you know, that we've got this pure Africa, um, you know, the wilds of Africa kind of stuck in our. And so I think what's really, from my perspective, really lovely is really showing that continuity. Yeah, no, I would love to, you know, and I'll come over here so you know, I'll turn around. Um, i chime in on that. The, um, which clothing are the, the ethnographic frame? Yeah, yeah, ethnographic present. So just wanting the, the pieces to to remain static like that is something I didn't want to see happen. And, you know, as a museum professional, looking at, at work and how it's installed is very important. So um, one of the things that I, that I can't do in this installation, but I try to tell people as we tour, um, is to talk about the use of these objects, the fact that they were ritually used, and that you don't see that context, and that they are considered viable, almost living objects, um, and that they're not frozen in the past. And so the, the head of the Galilea mask, or the epic Galilea mask, or the, the Sunday mask, or any one of those, is only a piece of an entire costume in a context worn by a person in a village, you're missing all of those pieces, right? That happen throughout time. So to connect it and show it in a more viable way, I think is um, is incredibly important um, because otherwise you're doing a disservice to each individual piece and the people that create them and utilize them. But to, to speak about the breadth of the project, yeah, you're right on that. I I wanted to make that connection. Um, and I was so lucky to find Tara Rice, who is from Vermont, studied in California, lives in Brooklyn, New York, a young woman who is just starting her photography career, but uh, someone who, like me and a lot of people I know, love art and social action, and who want to make a direct connection to something that's really socially important and shine a light on it. Um, so she made those photographs in Senegalese villages of her another project. Um, which is uh, effective. Um, they're having trouble with funding, but they work in Senegal and, and Sierra Leone and the Gambia and Mali, and they are effectively getting to the grandmothers, speaking to the grandmothers to persuade the parents to stop early marriage, to stop you know thirteen year olds from getting married, and to stop fourteen year olds from having babies, and to stop genital mutilation because those traditions are happening cheek and jowl with beautiful and good traditions. And it all goes underground and they continue to happen. So if you can kind of honor those traditions that are going to be passed down and stop the harmful practices, it's a tough balance. But I felt like having that um, and in color photographs brings you right up to the present. That was my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. How did I end up up here? Um, yeah, any other questions? I'll sit back down. Someone's making an action, but anyhow, my understanding uh, in Africa, much of the pottery is made by women. So like the Dabakari, funerary, this is exclusively made by women. Other so, in that case, the women are making the art. Most of the art that we're cutting is made for use by men. Either even though it's a already female mask danced by a man, the exceptions being throwaway masks, I assume they're called by men, but they but they're worn exclusively by women. Men do not dance by this. Right. And they blue play students of female, but they the female students are made specifically for women. Um, just curious about the sorts of things that are meant for exclusive use by women, and then again, there's also not that many areas where the women actually make them. Yeah, I mean, the, so you're at the general rule, and there are some exceptions, is that uh, uh, ceramics, terracotta is sort of the 
medium of women, uh, and then wood is the medium of men. And, and in general, this is absolutely true across the continent. Uh, wood is seen as a very um, uh, powerful, uh, it has, uh, it's like in West Africa, it might have nyama, which is life force and spirit. Um, and so it can be a very dangerous um, medium. Uh, and a typically, I mean, you have some artisans who exclusively work in wood, sometimes you have uh, blacksmiths often also work in wood, and blacksmiths hold a very special space because of their ability to transform metal. Um, in, yeah, there, so Sande, um, the itinerant artists who carve um, sew-in masks for the Sande Society um, are they are removed from society while they're carving the mask, typically. Um, and they take on this sort of genderless role um, where they're, they, because they know the secrets of Bondo, because they know the secrets of Sande, they um, are no longer a man, no longer men, but, but because they're not initiates, um, they are not women. So they have this sort of this, yeah, this sort of space where gender is no longer um, the, the main identifier. Um, yeah, Sande is exclusively performed by women. There is a male counterpart to Sande, to Soe. Um, and there's also, and, and typically women don't mask. Um, the exception to this, and my guess is that there's probably even more, but you know, scholars and researchers and collectors haven't been able to penetrate it in the same way. There's a masking tradition called Lepico uh, in um, Mozambique in southern Tanzania um, uh, along the Macan uh, by the Makande um, in the way of Tato. Um, and Lepico is, a, I mean, a very old masking tradition. Um, it's transformed a bit over the centuries. But um, it was recently uh, Alex Borlo, who um, now works for the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, he did his PhD at Columbia. Um, he uh, wrote about women who create their own Lepico masks out of clay um, and perform Lepico as well, you know, merging this sort of women's craft with. Um, this old kind of male masking tradition. Um, so yeah, there's there's some crossover. I don't think it's quite as like clear, but the you're, you sort of capture the general rules. Um, and then you know textiles. Kind of like both. Uh, no, I mean they're both? With, yeah, both do weaving. You know, or like both, for example, kuba cloths. You know, both, both participate in making kuba cloths. So. Yeah, we. I mean, we can kind of identify these very particular rules, but like, um, uh, yeah. I mean, in general, and then maps. Very interesting extension of that mm -hmm. is that whatever is created by women, which is textile, pottery, and all mm -hmm. that, we call that artifact. Whereas masks and sculptures, we call it art. So it is that the whole thing has been put on the paper, right. whatever is made, and hopefully it will change. And, you know, but at yeah. least traditionally, that has been the case. And so many scholars earlier wrote that uh, artifacts are not art, it's just daily usage. Right. And it may reflect art, but it is at the best on the periphery of Africa. Uh, no, I mean, it's a great point. I, you know, and this, uh, of course, I don't know if anyone is following it, but uh, President Macron uh, from France has uh, uh, made a commitment to repatriate, uh, you know, all of the appropriate objects uh, back to their former colonies. Um, and what is very interesting about this is it's much more complex, I would say, than, than just, you know, sending everything back. Um, but 
we have to remember that the way in which these collections were developed um, were by you know European collectors, explorers, and missionaries and diplomats and um, colonial officers coming in and saying this is art and you know I want to display it in a Western style. But of course, what we know is that we've always privileged these sort of certain art forms over others, and typically the ones that are on the periphery are the you know women's arts, needlepoint or drawing, things like that, that, you know, sort of get brushed aside. No, so, so, no. about that with the Chinese tradition where pottery is the most privileged and the top is the form, mm -hmm. accepted. And here, uh, again, the potters were, I presume, men in China. Mm -hmm. But here, in African society, this were the labor women for Right. To an architect rather than, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I probably the most powerful thing that will change that is the fact that the market can't really sustain just you know sculptures and masks and things like that. So you see these objects of adornment and personal use and ceramics and things like that sort of play a more prominent role in the market today. Um, and you know, I mean, nothing drives you know, categorization like money. So um, I think that it's that's where we'll begin to see some shift. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's a, a great point. Well, I think in, in, in conjunction with that, speaking of France, that uh, despite all of the uh, complexities about the uh, creation of the Museum of K. Brown Lee, mm -hmm. uh, much of what is displayed at Cape Cod came from the, uh, what was determined, what was called an ethnological mm -hmm. museum, and, the, and the, the the notion very much with Cape Cod that it was art. Right, mm -hmm. and yeah, absolutely. Moving from the Trocadero to the Museum of Long to um, uh, to the Cape Cod League was was a big uh, step in that direction, um, but. Of course, created in contrast to the Louvre. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's it is still sort of straddling, it you know, is. all of these definitions. But you know, slowly but surely. And if I can be so bold, mm -hmm. if one goes to your own museum, the Carlos, mm -hmm. in certain galleries such as Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Mesoamerican, it has a much more ethnographic style of installation. But with your recent installation of the African galleries. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're placing much more artistic emphasis upon the object and getting away from the ethnographic style of installation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I think that, you know, I mean, the big sort of discussion is like, well, there's no word for our art in African languages. They weren't creating art. Uh, but they were clearly creating aesthetic objects. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that if we're, Talking about porcelain, or you know, we can look at other places that we have no issues saying, you know, this is art, even though it serves a function. But I think there's, I mean, uh, a very old, you know, racist argument for why we don't do that for mm -hmm. Africa. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist or mm -hmm. an ethnographer. I'm an art historian. So I look at these objects through the lens of their aesthetic, uh, their aesthetic value, rather than you know, even to me, their function or even their history in a lot of ways is secondary um, to whether or not they're they're beautiful and and acquired responsibly. I think that is extremely important. I mean, we're really going into conversations here, but thinking about classification, thinking about France, makes me think of. Um, uh, Pierre Bordeaux, a sociologist who, you know, in a very classist and very um, uh, gender biased way, tried to, you know, organize art and culture into these spheres of legitimacy in which, you know, he, he, he clearly saw opera and painting as legitimate and, and things that might have been more in a man's realm and then things like textiles and 
needle point and things that were probably going to be crafts in a women's realm. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's more of a sociological study right. that we're kind of talking about. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, and I think that uh, what's interesting is we don't actually apply the methodologies that we apply to Western art to African art. Right. Um, and so, you know, like we we somehow have let sort of our prejudices and our, you know, the, this sort of vocabulary that we use to talk about African art in the, the turn of the century to sort of infiltrate the way we talk about it today. And, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, we've gotten a lot better, but, um, but at the same time, we don't actually, um, you know, truly apply these these methods for looking and um, these methods for pushing the objects the way we do, let's say, in, in like a European camp. Mm -hmm. How inspirational to modern artists are some of these traditional pieces? Um, you mean like Picasso? Well, no, I'm like, beyond Picasso. Yeah. Uh, Picasso is very obvious, right? Uh, we'll come to the Carlos right now. Oh, we'll see the exhibition that's up. Um, Tell me about it. What is it? So we, we have a work, uh, uh, an exhibition called Do or Die, uh, which is work by Famu Piku, who's an Atlanta-based artist. Um, and he created what he calls a new world gungun. Um, a gungun is a traditional Yorba masquerade from southwest Nigeria. Uh, and a gungun traveled pretty extensively through the slave trade, so you see a gungun practices Emerge in, you know, Bahia, Port au Prince, um, Havana, you know, America, and then it also made its way back to Sierra Leone. Um, and, you know, I think what's interesting about, for example, Fahamu's work is, is a Gungu mask, but he really explored these intersections between American popular culture and, and this traditional African mask, this historical African mask. And, like I said, sort of created this continuity, this link between the two traditions, but it's clearly a mask um, made for Americans, you know, and, and reflects contemporary um, socio-political um, conflicts and, and issues. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, we, um, you know, especially African art is gaining prominence in a new way. Um, so if you go to um, Hammond's house right now, there's an exhibition called Dandelions, which is about um, black dandyism in the Congo, in Brazzaville. Um, the Sepros, um who dress in these like, beautiful, elaborate, colorful suits. Um, and so we see definitely these kinds of um, aesthetics coming to the forefront. Um, if, uh, and fashion on the continent, like, you know, Vogue did a spread on fashion in Ghana and Nigeria as though, like, it just emerged. Um, they, they did this huge spread in 2017-2018. But, you know, so I think that, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the aesthetic traditions that are quite old and quite entrenched in just African visual culture are, um, I don't want to say trendy, but or trending, um, but are, are being seen or are sort of running against, are running with the sort of aesthetic interests of Western international artists and designers um, and, you know, the trendsetters. So.